We'll get started in about one minute. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. I'm sure we'll have a few others join. Uh, my name's Eric Daly. I'm managing principal of Multnomah Group. Uh, appreciate everybody's attendance today uh, in uh, a topic that I hope uh, will be uh, enlightening. It's certainly uh, one that's uh, dear to my heart uh, as it relates to managing retirement benefits uh, in higher education. You know, as we get started, a couple of housekeeping items uh, that I'd love to point out. Uh, the first of which is you've all been muted. Um, so you can't shout me down at any point during today's presentation. Um, uh, but that said, we would like to make it as interactive as possible. So what you'll find uh, is that in uh, the Zoom application, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions. I would encourage you to do so. Um, I'll try and cover those over the course of today's presentation uh, and address as many as I can and any that I'm uh, uh, unable to uh, get back to you as quickly as I can with uh, some resolution. Um, the second of which is we're recording today's presentation. Uh, so to the extent that uh, you want to uh, review it, revisit it at a later date, you'll have the opportunity to do that, uh, as well as to review some of the materials that I'll be covering in today's presentation. Um, uh, it's a, again, a relatively narrow presentation, unlike some of our uh, uh, previous webinars uh, focused on the higher education space, uh, a space that's important clearly to the firm. Uh, we've got uh, several dozen uh, clients in higher education, and, and it's an area where we spend a, a, a not insignificant portion of our time firm-wide. Um, I, I wanted to maybe start just by laying the groundwork uh, as to you know, why higher education and retirement benefits specifically in higher education are, are critically important. I think it's a time of significant flux, clearly. Um, we're going to talk about four areas uh, pertaining to uh, retirement plans in higher education, uh, the fiduciary governance and litigation side, which I think has been discussed at, at kind of at length, uh, the design and strategy side, uh, the operations and administration side, uh, and then the vendor side, and, and really how all those things play together. Um, but while that's happening, I think it's also important to, to take a step back and look at the broader context. Um, it, it is becoming increasingly important uh, the, the role that colleges and universities play in the country, uh, both from a, a general education of the electorate perspective, uh, and secondarily to increase uh, the economic growth in the country. Uh, unemployment is down to 3.9%, and in a number of areas, uh, the country is short uh, the skilled workers that will be required to continue to grow the economy. Um, that said, during this time where we probably need colleges and universities as much or more than ever, uh, what we're finding is that enrollment is down, uh, according to the National Student Clearinghouse Center. Uh, 2017 was the sixth straight year of undergraduate enrollment declines, uh, a trend that is expected to continue uh, for some time hereafter. Uh, if uh, you uh, have a, a law, uh, pardon me, a law school as, as part of your campus, uh, enrollment uh, in JD programs is at, at its lowest level since 1974, uh, and down a full 30% from its peak a mere seven or eight years ago. Uh, and all of these enrollment uh, declines are having an impact. I was uh, saddened to see that one of our longtime clients and a, a really a staple. Uh, of the higher education environment here in Portland uh, would be closing its doors after uh, 125 years of, of critical service and, and adding uh, uh, you know, highly skilled workers and productive citizens to the Portland community. Um, 
but it's highlighting, I think, uh, again, a role that um, uh, that retirement plans play. Um, as the desires and needs of undergraduates and graduate students are changing at a high rate, um, it's having a, a, an impact uh, in the ability of colleges and universities to try and re-engineer their workforces rapidly uh, to meet these rapidly changing needs. Um, as we take a look at today's presentation, I'll, I'll try and kind of call back on some of these factors because I do think uh, it impacts that. And then simultaneously, uh, while higher education is going through this tremendous period of, uh, of, of turmoil and, and, uh, and reinvention, uh, we also have uh, a period where uh, higher education institutions are, are being sued uh, for uh, the management of their retirement benefits. So again, creating this really critical time where both institutions are trying to manage the risks associated with providing retirement benefits. Uh, they're trying to create plans that are competitive and will allow them to attract uh, the, the new types of employees that will help them continue to grow uh, in the future. Uh, but see, because of uh, the enrollment levels we're experiencing are having to re-engineer how they provide benefits to make sure that the costs are, are manageable uh, in the new normal uh, for uh, higher education. So with that really is the backdrop, I'll start at the political and, and regulatory landscape side. And, and clearly the presentation uh, wasn't written yesterday, but it feels like a number of these issues were touched upon yesterday. You know, clearly a, a theme of the current administration has been a, a reduction uh, in regulation uh, and unwinding of Dodd-Frank, the critical uh, banking bill uh, that was passed uh, after the economic uh, collapse of 08, 09. Uh, only 20 hours ago, uh, the Congress passed a, a bill that would substantially unwind and eff effectively remove uh, a number of the protections that were put in place uh, during Dodd-Frank. Uh, second, uh, we've had the delaying and dismantling of the DOL fiduciary rule. So the fiduciary rule that essentially would create a higher burden uh, for both retirement plan providers uh, as well as uh, individuals who may be interested in soliciting IRA rollovers from your plan. Um, that at this point effectively appears to be dead as uh, yesterday the Fifth Circuit uh, declined the second appeal process brought by a number of states uh, to try and carry forth with the DOL, rule, DOL fiduciary rule as drafted by uh, the Department of Labor and the Obama administration. Um, enforcement uh, has declined and I think you know certainly as from a fiduciary perspective some of that may uh, may seem useful uh, in 2016 uh, the Employee Benefit Security Agency, the enforcement wing of the Department of Labor, uh, closed 2002 civil cases. In 2017, that was down to 1,700 civil investigations. I'd also point out uh, that the number uh, of enforcement agents in both those areas is at a low uh, by historical standards. Uh, SEC enforcement actions, so if you're looking just at general investment protection and enforcement actions, in 2016, the SEC enforcement unit had 868 actions, uh, last year 754. And again, all of those numbers had previous to 2017 uh, been on a, a relatively consistent uh, increase period. Um, the, the, the corresponding bad side, specifically for higher education, is that uh, Department of Labor enforcement may, may not be fun or attractive uh, from a fiduciary perspective or plan sponsor perspective, uh, but it's certainly far better uh, than litigation. And while uh, enforcement's on the decline, litigation's on the rise, and, and you know obviously exponentially on the rise uh, for uh, plan sponsors uh, in, in the higher education marketplace. You can see the tremendous uptick uh, in retirement plan cases filed over the course of the last several years. Um, and if you look at the litigation, I think it's really clear uh, that a successful uh, blueprint has been laid as far as how uh, plaintiffs, and specifically plaintiffs' attorneys' firms, uh, can uh, attack uh, retirement plans uh, and potentially uh, either uh, win judgments or even more likely than winning judgments, uh, the fact that they can go about the process of soliciting settlements. Uh, it's been a tremendously active year. 
uh, workers uh, that sued their employers under federal law that governs ERISA retirement plans uh, was $529 million uh, in 2017 across 30 cases. Um, why the increase? Well, I think the increases come from, um, you know, kind of uh, simple supply, demand, and research uh, data, right? There's uh, more new plaintiff's firms. Uh, clearly, the more success uh, plaintiff's firms have uh, in pursuing these types of cases, that breeds uh, copycat type approaches. Uh, the prior successes of these firms have generated massive sums uh, of dollars in the coffers, uh, mostly uh, of the, the plaintiff's firms, but in some cases for the participants as well. And, and changing regulations specific to higher education uh, and, and regulations tied, frankly, with a changing uh, culture and how these plans are viewed. Um, so both of those have created this opportunity where uh, retirement plans in higher education have not historically enjoyed the same level of scrutiny and management, perhaps, that you've seen in the 401k space. Uh, and while they're subject to the same set of rules under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, you know, arguably because of the tax rule changes back in 08, 09, um, they're really many years behind where some of their peers are in the 401k side. So if you look at that prior success of plaintiff's firms, um, this is the firm uh, who has been pursuing uh, the overwhelming majority of higher education uh, class action cases at this point, uh, Schlichter out of St. Louis. Uh, Schlichter has at this point earned just as their portion of these settlements, uh, well over $111 million uh, in uh, settlement dollars. Uh, so you can see clearly um, the motivation for a firm like that to find new types of defendants in the higher education marketplace uh, has been where they have uh, ultimately uh, settled on uh, from a pursuit perspective. Uh, and again, well, like some of the other slides, this one can be updated uh, as of a couple of days ago. So while we're showing you uh, the 18 cases uh, that are currently uh, pending against higher education institutions for breaches of ERISA fiduciary duty, uh, we can add to that the University of Rochester, uh, which will bring us up to 19. Um, if we look at the cases, they are largely similar. Uh, there are not tremendous differences, although clearly the fact pattern across the 19 uh, varies dramatically from institution to institution. Uh, but you could probably characterize them relatively simply as multiple record keepers in many cases, uh, and the claim being that having more than one record keeper uh, caused the plan to pay higher fees, taking a larger sum of money, chopping it up into smaller pieces. Uh, the second claim uh, that too many total investment options uh, created confusion uh, in participants. Uh, the third, uh, revenue sharing arrangements led to excessive fees. So the fact that investment options uh, may be subsidizing directly or indirectly, uh, the cost of providing services to these plans uh, having an impact on the total cost. Uh, and then that the use of actively managed funds rather than index funds resulted in higher fees. Uh, and then fifth, uh, that a lack of a competitive bidding process for third-party service providers also contributed to higher fees. You know, specific to each claim, there are also claims, uh, as we certainly have seen in the case uh, of NYU, which is, uh, uh, has been in the courts. And I think they've closed uh, both testimony for the plaintiffs and defendants in that case, and it's uh, facing the judge currently. So there have also been claims relative to specific investment products. Um, and whether those products underperformed or performed adequately relative to their benchmarks. But I think the five claims probably that are most material from a plan sponsor perspective uh, are the notion of these claims that costs are too high, because as you look at settlements and assessing potential damages, uh, that's an area where historically uh, plaintiff's firms uh, have been successful, and I think ultimately where uh, Schlichter uh, and the plaintiffs they represent will be pursuing these 19 institutions to try and either win judgment or get settlement. Um, we've updated some of that. Certainly in the case of NYU, the class has been certified. The case has been heard. We await uh, the judge's decision. Uh, in the case of the University of uh, the Penn, UPenn, uh, that case has been dismissed uh, but is on appeal. Uh, in many other cases, uh, there have been uh, dismissals that have been heard by the judge 
uh, and in most cases those dismissals have been denied, although in many cases pieces of those uh, dismissals or elements of the claims that have been brought by the plaintiffs have been dismissed and others uh, have been left to carry on. Um, you know, what we've learned from the fee litigation and, and again, the, the, the case that's actually been uh, in front of the judge uh, related to NYU, you know, it's, it's really clear these cases aren't going away. I think Rochester is a great example, right, um, of uh, nobody's going to wait around to see whether the original 18 are successful or not. They're going to continue uh, to find potential defendants, uh, it, obviously, in hopes that they are successful, and that'll set some precedent related to the others that follow behind. Um, I do think the good news in the NYU case clearly is that um, we have seen a certainly at least initially, uh, less willingness to settle these cases. Uh, in the 401k space, settlement has been the primary approach with a few exceptions. I think because of the, the work that you all do in higher education and the importance of uh, reputation, I, I think it is uh, more likely uh, that defendants in higher education will choose to litigate uh, demonstrate the work that they've done uh, on the behalf of their employees uh, in an attempt to really set a precedent that demonstrates the strength uh, of higher education retirement plans. You know, as I mentioned, we work uh, with 107 different institutions across the country. Uh, several dozen of those are in higher education. If we look at, you know, average retirement benefits, size of contributions, um, those are all areas where uh, higher education clients uh, tend to provide a much higher level of benefit, both from a dollar perspective, uh, and, and work, I think, very diligently to try and make sure that these plans work effectively. So litigating these cases clearly puts it in the hands of a judge. Um, and when you put something in the hands of a single judge, it, that can turn out a lot of different ways. But I do think that uh, many, many of these higher education institutions seem prone uh, to litigate the cases. Uh, because, uh, you know, at least from the perspective of Schlichter, the uh, plaintiff's firm, this is a, a new and attractive place. It's actually the highest area uh, of uh, ERISA case growth in 2017, from really zero virtually up to the 19 cases now that we have over 2017 and 18. Um, and while judge, judges are dismissing some of the claims um, they're not dismissing others. So again, except in the case of Penn, um, we haven't seen full dismissals. And even in cases where we've had full dismissals, uh, we're still working through, or those defendants are still working through uh, the appellate process. But as we look at the, 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 the claims that are being dismissed, likely the ones where we're seeing more success than not is the notion that too many investment options is in some way uh, disadvantaging participants. So if you see a commonality among dismissals, that particular claim has been less successful, not not never successful, but less successful than others. Uh, encouraging, clearly, if you look at the decision in the Penn case, uh, where the, uh, uh, the plaintiffs claimed that uh, Penn using an asset-based fee payment mechanism rather than a per capita mechanism uh, was a fiduciary breach. I think that the defendants were successful in demonstrating that, um, that, that either one of those approaches, either asset-based or per capita, would have been successful, and neither was just on its face some kind of fiduciary breach. Um, you know, the last, clearly, you know, continuing procedural prudence uh, of the fiduciary functions continues to be the best way uh, that uh, higher education institutions can kind of defend against these cases. And we'll talk a little bit about some details around that. But if we continue that on, um, again, the leading case is Sacerdote versus New NYU. Um, the, 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 the good news from those that are close to the case is that uh, obviously all the arguments have been heard. Uh, the judge has a at least a internal deadline to get it out. He's going to lose. Um, uh, uh, some of his support staff and, and wants to get this done and, and over with before they go away. Um, so that could be uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, important, obviously, to point out that like the dismissal at UPenn, um, ultimately, even if NYU is to be successful in this case, it's unlikely that that means that the plaintiffs uh, uh, don't try and continue and, and obviously appeal the decision on the other side. 
from a procedural prudence perspective, before we get into some of the other aspects, but I think you can't really talk about what's happening in higher education without talking about the litigation. Um, as it relates to prudence, I think a few things that are important to point out. Um, fiduciaries really need to be able to provide evidence of prudence and process. And I think not being able to do so clearly creates more risk for the institutions. Um, you know, anything that you can do to create that prudence makes it infinitely more likely uh, that you'll have any success in either a summary judgment or in having uh, elements of the claim procedure dismissed. When looking at that, the, the facts and documentation will ultimately be important. Do we have consistent documents and policy statements? Have we followed those documents and policy statements? Do our committee members understand why we made the decisions we made and can they articulate that well? And last and clearly not least, uh, is the importance of good written minutes. And talking to some of the counsel for defendants in these cases, uh, their instruction has been to make sure that the minutes that they have are written in such a way that they're useful to the primary users of the minutes. I think frequently we view minutes as the way that we convey information from committee meeting to committee meeting, and I think that is one of the purposes, right, is to, to try and help committee members who may only touch the retirement plan a handful of times a year uh, to remember where they are in the process. It's also important to point out uh, that the government is a potential user of those, right? So if the Department of Labor comes, uh, they're going to be looking at minutes related to decisions as they decide which direction a potential Department of Labor audit would go. Uh, but third and most importantly, the plaintiff's attorneys are going to be looking at those minutes. And, and they're going to be looking for uh, evidence of inconsistent approach, uh, lack of uh, procedural prudence, uh, lack of process, and, and try and use that as an opportunity to demonstrate and be successful in their claims. Writing the minutes in such a way that it helps uh, potential or potential committee members um, understand and recall the decisions they made and that you've retained the documentation supporting the decision makes it infinitely easier in the event that some of your committee members are going to be deposed uh, and ultimately trying to recall uh, actions and decisions that they may have made two, four, six uh, years prior. And because, um, you know, as institutions, we tend to try and immunize risk uh, by purchasing insurance, um, it, it's also clear uh, that the insurers that provide uh, fiduciary uh, coverage to many institutions have become significantly more interested. As you can imagine, going back to the previous slide of 401k settlements, most of those 401k settlements are being held, you know, handled, at least in part, by insurance companies who are providing coverage. Um, you know, clearly, the cost of fiduciary insurance coverage has historically not been high, uh, but if the rate of settlements and secondarily, if institutions continue to lose uh, cases on the 403b side, Insurers are clearly worried about having uh, adequate resources to pay. We've seen tremendous scrutiny among fiduciary liability insurers as they talk to higher education clients um, going into 2018. Um, for the first time, uh, really in the 15 years that we've been practicing here at Multnomah Group, um, we've had uh, RFI questions come back from insurers asking questions about uh, RFP processes related to providers, uh, costing structures, and other things. Some of it's driven by, you know, grossly inaccurate information. I think if you look at some of the class action cases that are out there, the, the claim is that all record keeping should be $35 per participant. Um, realistically, I don't think there's any providers in the country that are very interested in doing record keeping at $35 a head, but the insurers who don't touch these plans on a regular basis haven't been through an RFP process, um, have, have used that as some kind of benchmark. Uh, and what they're finding clearly is everybody pays more than $35 a head. Um, so, but it's going to require uh, both A, more time uh, for the folks that work uh, on risk mitigation to try and help explain these issues to the underwriters. Uh, but they could also be asking for some of the documentation that I mentioned previously uh, related to how the plan operates. So let's move on to happier topics. Um, 
the, the happier topic really is the, the plan design piece. So I think institutions really are working pretty hard to re-engineer the workforce. And I think re-engineering the workforce has two primary components. Uh, one, it, it has the component of making sure that employees who put in uh, a long service over a working career at your institutions are in a place where they can successfully retire outside of the typical pension structure. Uh, and two is having a competitive uh, retirement plan structure where the new types of employees, whether they be uh, staff, administration, or faculty, uh, can be attracted to your institution as you try and re-engineer your organizations. So if we take a look at the, the first piece of that, I think it has to do with ensuring uh, that our current participants are saving adequately and accumulating enough for retirement. And I think one of the things that institutions struggle with as it relates to this particular topic uh, is understanding how much a person may need uh, to prepare for retirement adequately. And I think it is, by and large, a byproduct of income and wage. Uh, income and wage being the lower your income, the more of it you'll have to replace because so much of it goes to essentials. Uh, the higher your income, the less of it you're likely to have to replace um, over retirement. Um, but there's a secondary factor to that as well, uh, as it relates to low-income workers. Much more uh, of their income will be replaced by Social Security, meaning they need less uh, from a supplemental retirement savings perspective. Higher income earners experience just the opposite. While they need less, uh, less is provided by Social Security, and as a result, the gap, the difference between what they need to uh, accumulate in their retirement savings accounts becomes much, much greater. In, in helping institutions design plans, what we tend to do is look at, well, given market volatility is not a factor we can control, um, given retirement age is not a factor we can control, given that retirement spending is not a factor we can control, how do we ultimately get to a place where we can help participants at least get to the one factor that they have control over, and that ultimately is their level of savings? Uh, and we do that by helping walk clients through what it would actually cost the typical wage earner in various pay bands to get to retirement. And as you look at that, clearly this isn't definitive, right? If markets only go down over a 40-year working career, uh, and I save 15% over my entire working career, um, that's probably still going to lead to a bad outcome. So we have to look at what the probability of successfully achieving that retirement would be. Uh, and what we find ultimately is when you get to the 90 and 95% probability thresholds, which I think uh, realistically in a defined contribution setting where we can't force anybody to retire, it's very difficult to get someone to retire if they don't have that level of certainty. For wage earners that are earning more than $100,000, they need to be saving somewhere between 20 and as much as 35% of their, their, their compensation. Um, you would hope uh, that they're doing some supplemental savings outside the retirement plan. And then realistically, institutions are saying, well, where do we as an institution want to try and get people to? Is it realistic to try and get um, our wage earners to target our contribution level, for instance, to those earning less than $100,000? Can we get people between supplemental contributions and employer contributions up to a 19.8 or 20% contribution rate? And how do we go about doing that? Um, and for those that earn more than that, we have to also recognize uh, that we're going to need to provide potentially other supplemental savings, whether it's top hat 457B plans, or they'll be saving in a taxable environment um, outside uh, the purview of the employer. How do we get to that type of approach? Um, we are increasingly seeing uh, modifications to how higher education institutions design their plans. I think that uh, the prevalent model, both in uh, public plans as well as private plans uh, for the last couple of decades has been um, very large employer contributions uh, without regard to whether the employee participates, uh, and then the opportunity for participants to make contributions in a supplemental environment. Um, given the, the factors of trying to attract new employees, make sure that employees retire on time and managing costs, I think we're seeing a number of factors that employers are taking into account in higher education. 
clearly the rate of automatic enrollment in higher education is rapidly increasing. Um, one of the, the, certainly the negatives of an employee-er funded retirement um, is that it could lead participants to believe that they don't need to save. Uh, so automatically enrolling them addresses that problem and communicates that yes, we make a large uh, contribution to the plan, but you will need to also participate to generate a successful retirement. Um, on the cost savings side, we're seeing more institutions implement uh, vesting on employer contributions. And the notion here, of course, being that uh, most institutions are interested in rewarding their longest tenured employees and having some period of vesting where if employees don't stay for the entire period, some portion of the contributions uh, are forfeited back to the plan uh, does help manage cost and target benefits to the longer term employees. Uh, to try and uh, incent participants to view these as long-term savings accounts, we're seeing uh, significant changes in loan availability. I think if you go back 20 years, it was not uncommon uh, in higher education for plans to have an unlimited number of loans. The only limitation then being uh, the $50,000 or 50% of their, or their vested account, leading participants to kind of serially take distribution. And obviously, the, 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 the cost of that being twofold, one, the missed opportunity cost of those dollars being invested in earning returns, uh, but B, uh, the, the likelihood that, frankly, those loan payments uh, starve out any ability for participants to make supplemental contributions to a plan. Uh, next, reducing the amount of in-service distributions. Uh, it has been very, very common in higher education for plans to say, hey, once you've hit 59 and a half, you can start taking distributions uh, because the IRS permits it. But, you know, the challenge in higher education is that um, while many participants are ready to retire, meaning that they financially have adequate resources to have a, a strong retirement, um, one of the reasons that ultimately uh, they don't retire is that they're their, their connection to the community uh, that they work in is so high uh, that losing that connection uh, is scary for many. Um, I, I think by allowing participants to both take in-service distributions and receive benefits, health, compensation, and other, uh, it, it makes it easier to forego or forestall uh, dealing with the, the tough decision of when is the right time to retire. So we're seeing you know, many institutions try and uh, restrict in-service distributions, uh, except in the event of, uh, you know, partial or, or planned or scheduled retirement programs uh, that they may be working on in conjunction with their staffs. Um, we're clearly seeing changes in eligibility provisions. Uh, the eligibility provisions we've seen, the, the organization of adjuncts and graduate assistants across the country, uh, and employers trying to find ways to address that without obviously having to do it uh, through a collective bargaining type approach. Uh, and last but not least is we are seeing institutions move away from, uh, in some cases, the we make a large contribution to the plan approach to a shared approach. Uh, and again, um, that highlights the importance of having participants who save and defer to the plan, uh, but also has uh, potentially, depending on the institution and how you design it, some cost saving elements uh, as well for those institutions uh, where that is a high priority. You know, if we take a look just at the automatic enrollment piece, I think that's one of the more compelling ones. In 2017, uh, Vanguard released their uh, America Saves report. Uh, and what ultimately you continue to find when you look at it is plans that use voluntary enrollment uh, mechanisms where a participant has to sign up to save supplementally, get participation rates that are about 63%. By the way, that includes plans that have a match where participants would be highly incented, um, obviously, to make some form of participation. Uh, and if you, you know, if you uh, flip that and say, well, if we go to a negative election or an automatic enrollment, that quickly moves to 90%. I think, you know, frankly, because of the design in higher education, the the, the data would support the plans without automatic enrollment and without. Uh, some form of matching contribution are likely to have participation rates that are in the low 50s. Uh, so moving to an automatic enrollment, getting partic participants uh, engaged quickly, I think is is clearly material. 
The second piece of that is clearly the auto escalation piece. We're seeing more and more higher education institutions both automatically enroll uh, and then automatically increase until a participant opts out to try and get participants to the, the correct or at least the predetermined uh, targeted savings rate or all the way to the statutory $18,500 cap. On the plan administration side, um, while the number of Department of Labor audits is down, uh, I don't have a good measure uh, as to whether the number of IRS audits is down. Um, I can say that um, without any data to support it, the number of our higher education clients that are going through internal revenue service audits is, is up, uh, but obviously that's a, a relatively small sample size in comparison to the country. Um, as we look at higher education plans, we're continuing to see plan operations errors. Um, a number of institutions are working pretty aggressively to try and integrate their employment payroll practices, uh, centralize those practices, but the historic model uh, of human resources in higher education almost serving as a personnel function rather than a human resource function is causing more and more of these potential um, uh, IRS problems. Um, and as we look at the big problems, um, the number one continues to be definition of compensation. Um, in higher education, especially as we're trying to attract, recruit, retain, um, you know, senior administration, uh, in some cases, senior faculty, uh, the compensation models are becoming more and more complex. Uh, and uh, making sure that the folks who are processing payroll have an understanding of how that interacts with the definition of compensation that we're using uh, within the plan document. Because without that understanding, the likelihood uh, for an error there is tremendously high. Um, we continue to have institutions that because of um, internal antiquated payroll systems are, are struggling uh, to get their contributions into the retirement plan. Um, as soon as administratively practicable as the Department of Labor requires. Um, certainly improperly administering eligibility requirements. Um, you know, again, as, as people are out recruiting faculty and administration, um, they're doing so in ways that are promising benefits that they may not yet be eligible for. So understanding those eligibility criteria, uh, making sure that they um, are adhered to, uh, you know, despite obviously the desire to attract uh, new employees to your institution. We still have a number of institutions that are failing to conduct the uh, uh, non-discrimination testing. Um, there's a number of tests. ADP may not be one of them for 403B plans, but uh, ACP, compensation testing, general testing, all areas where plans need to be tested depending on their design, uh, and failing to do so. Uh, clearly puts them at risk and will probably show up both in IRS audits as well as potentially of your independent auditors. Um, you know, failure to send out participant notices uh, is another that continually uh, catches uh, sponsors in higher education. I think one of the more common ones uh, is something like distribution of a summary plan description. So uh, merely putting our summary plan descriptions on our websites, which is, you know, traditionally the practice in higher education, uh, is not akin to, to delivering it. So the requirements of delivery are just that, requirements of delivery that can't be met merely by posting in a public place. And the one I think the IRS has been most focused on over the course of the last couple of audits that we've seen um, are these uh, employees who are eligible for and required to take uh, required minimum distributions at age 70 and a half when they're no longer employed. Uh, specifically in the 401A space, uh, those requirements are, are, are certainly codified. Uh, and if employees aren't taking those MRDs, while you would think the uh, penalty would be against the participant themselves, in reality, the penalty is against the plan sponsor. In the 403B area, that's an area where I think the, uh, the guidance is less clear but I think the Internal Revenue Service still has an expectation that even for 403B plans, participants are taking their MRDs. That's clear, they're required to do so. I think the only issue of debate uh, is whether their failure to do so is a failure at the plan level or the participant level. In discovering the plan errors, I, I, I think it's really critically important that committees 
and those that administer these plans on behalf of institutions understand that um, nearly every, I'm not even going to go with nearly, every plan in the country has an operational error somewhere, um, whether you've seen it yet or not. Um, however, it is vastly better to find your errors than it is for someone else to find them. You know, clearly the best course of action is identify an error, either at the committee level or at the operational error, repair the error, document the repair, move on. Um, for most plan sponsors, certainly on the private side, less so on the governmental side, they're required to have independent audits uh, by outside accounting firms. That's the next best way. That audit uh, is owned by the participants in the plan, and if those auditors discover errors, there's still an opportunity then uh, for you as institutions to repair those errors, uh, make amendments, make corrections, make participants whole, and move on. The least optimal, clearly, is to have those uh, detected by the Department of Labor or the Internal Revenue Service. When those occur, um, we then lose much leverage in how they're going to be corrected. At that point, um, the correction mechanism will be dictated. You certainly can attempt to negotiate it, um, but the leverage is small uh, in situations like that. On the preventing plan error side, I think it is really important that committees uh, work to ensure that on the operation side, that those that interact, we in payroll, benefits, human resources, and finance have policies, procedures, and internal controls. Um, that's what the auditors will be looking for, and they're looking for them because they're successful in, pre in preventing these errors from occurring. Um, have a process for evaluating those, whether you're a governmental institution or a private institution, go back, evaluate those policies and procedures, have them owned by someone or some group of people within the institution to ensure that they're being adhered to. Uh, continue to engage in training for all the stakeholders. So for committee members, it's going to be fiduciary training. Uh, for your admin personnel, it's going to be operational training. Um, when you discover errors, don't bury them, find them, document them, uh, correct them to a reasonable degree uh, so that in the event that an auditor comes back and discovers them, you can point out what you've done. Uh, failing to find it is a poor defense. Finding it and attempting to correct it, even if it later it's determined to be an inadequate correction, uh, is far more favorable. And continually to fine tune your approach around managing payroll and benefits in such a way uh, that these gaps that have been historically true in higher education are closed. We're seeing more and more implementation of uh, total uh, human resource outsourcing systems uh, that are kind of end-to-end -end employee benefits and pay systems to try and remove the number of gaps, remove the amount of paper uh, that leads to potential errors in these cases. And the last, I think, um, on the vendor side, uh, we have seen a tremendous amount of movement um, you know, there are probably there are an unlimited number of providers that any of you could work with. This is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, um, but if we take them in alphabetical order, the five of the larger um, organizations providing record keeping administration, Fidelity, TIA, Transamerica, Valak, and Vanguard are all going through their own transactions, transitions. You know, Fidelity has been very successful over the course of the last five years in growing their uh, tax exempt market segment and has had some very notable wins. Um, as we look at uh, their fee model, I think they tend to move to a, a much more uh, fee for service type of approach where projects uh, carry additional costs uh, and being able to measure and adequately uh, communicate that and have a mechanism for paying it. You know, TIA clearly uh, has been under a tremendous amount of scrutiny, whether it's A, the litigation, or B, some of the coverage that they've received in the media over the course of the last year. Uh, which is causing participants to ask questions about how your plans operate. Uh, Transamerica, which had been successful uh, in a number of different regions uh, in the smaller to mid-market uh, for higher education, recently uh, concluded the acquisition of Mercer's record-keeping business, uh, which has been stressful. Anytime you merge a practice in like that, uh, it does tend to lead to a, a tremendous amount of disruption. I think at Valak, um, you know, they are going through their own growing pains and moving from more of an agent-based model uh, to an institutional model and the impact that that has on, on pricing, profitability, and how their service model operates. Uh, and then Vanguard, uh, which is a very, very late entrant. Uh, they've had some business in some areas for a long time, 
uh, but did, haven't had traditionally a comprehensive solution in this space. Uh, they've developed one now, uh, but it'll be interesting to see uh, whether this many years after the start of the uh, consolidation process, how competitive can they be, uh, you know, 2018 and beyond in the higher education marketplace. Um, the second thing to mention on the provider side is that revenue models uh, are changing. Um, we do fee benchmarking with our clients uh, on an annual basis and, and our client meetings over this quarter, uh, the second quarter, have been focused on this particular topic. If I were to look back just at our higher education clients across all vendors, um, we've had well over a million dollars in fee reductions uh, over the course of this cycle because of this uh, rapidly compressing uh, retirement plan uh, marketplace uh, from a fee perspective. So the impact of that is certainly uh, twofold. One is clearly great, right? Reducing plan expenses, uh, especially because plan expenses are almost always paid by uh, participants is a positive thing. Uh, so taking a million dollars in cost out is a million more dollars that'll be accruing over some period of time. Uh, but the second perspective clearly is that um, it's having an impact on how providers reinvest in their business. Uh, and ultimately how they monetize retirement servicing. Um, so as we look at the provider marketplace, I, I think that successful providers are having to uh, broaden their revenue perspective, meaning that if they're looking at record keeping as a standalone business, it's a relatively unattractive business. It's low margin, uh, there are many opportunities for error, um, and as a result, it, it's difficult to, uh, uh, to to make a case for making strong investments in retirement plan administration and communication. Uh, the providers who are able to make that commitment uh, probably can do so because having a retirement solution provides the opportunity to generate other much higher margin uh, revenues uh, on behalf of the firm. In many cases, clearly proprietary investment products. So you can pay me to do the record keeping administration, uh, but if half the investment products are my own, that's a very high margin business for me to be in. Uh, annuitization, so if you come from the insurance side of the record keeping perspective, um, having participants elect to annuitize their benefit um, also has a potential financial incentive uh, to the providers. Uh, we're seeing a huge increase in how actively and aggressively record keeping firms are marketing uh, managed account solutions. So uh, solutions wherein I give uh, the record keeper my money, they manage it, they transact, buy and sell the various securities over the course of the working career and I pay them a premium for that service. The IRA rollovers, I mean, uh, for those of you who are interacting with your plans, you're materially letting people uh, retire with six and seven figure account balances. Uh, they are very, very attractive retail clients potentially to institutions that may wanna help them with the decumulation phase. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing an increase in project fees, whether they be for fund changes, special projects, testing, reporting, as potential ways to try and um, augment uh, some of the revenue sources. And then cross-selling products. Um, so for providers, it could be cross-selling insurance products, it could be cross-selling uh, HSA services, payroll services. Uh, there are a number of other ways to try and take a relationship and try and add and monetize the relationship. Um, some of those things are good, some of those things are bad. Um, actually, probably any of them could be good or bad depending on the quality of the solution. I, I do think what it does is highlight the need for uh, plan sponsors to do what they can reasonably do to make sure that their participants are educated and knowledgeable uh, about purchase of financial products. Um, I think it is, um, it, it's certainly sad when uh, you've put together a, a, a successful retirement plan, you had a professor that hits age 70, wants to retire, they have a million dollars, um, they take that million dollars out of a very low cost effective retirement plan and roll it into an IRA account uh, and buy variable annuity deferred insurance contracts. Um, you know, it, it took decades to try and develop a, an adequate retirement nest egg, and it takes literally minutes uh, to, to reduce the effectiveness of the decumulation process um, and in a way that's really not uh, at the benefit of the participant. 
Um, we're seeing huge changes in fee modeling. Some of this I, was really in play, frankly, far before uh, the, uh, the Schlichter cases came about uh, for higher education institutions, but I think you know, clearly have probably been accelerated by that. I, I do think we're seeing, especially in higher education where average account balances are so high, uh, many institutions move away from asset-based pricing into per capita pricing. Uh, where fees are set per participant instead of as a chunk of assets, especially after a decade where market uh, increases have been as substantial as they've been. Uh, we are seeing certainly increases in fee transparency and the demand for increases in fee transparency. The more and more clients going to a pure pass-through where any fee deductions are shown directly on participant statements. Uh, we're seeing really good discussions about fee equity. I think there's obviously discussions across the country uh, and you know, quite definitely on uh, college campuses uh, about equity across a number of areas. And um, this is not as important as those, but one that I think is a focus of uh, retirement committees across the country. Um, is revenue sharing the right way to pay for uh, retirement plan services? Um, how do we ensure that no one participant, whether it's asset-based or per capita, pays an unreasonable amount uh, for the services they're receiving? And in the case where plans are getting revenue credits because they've been successful in reducing fees and they're having you know, their providers uh, rebate uh, expenses back to them, how do we get those dollars back in the hands of the participants who generated them? And in many cases, we're seeing uh, more clear, more straightforward tiering models. We've seen institutions go to models where participants under a certain threshold don't pay expenses uh, and others play a fat fee. We've played, we've seen other clients move to multiple tier approaches and, and others move to either a pure, straight, per capita or pro rata pass through. And, and I, you know, I tend to agree with at least this portion of the, the decision in the Penn case. No one of those answers is the right answer, but having a deliberate uh, process to discuss them, uh, have a philosophy around how you're allocating expenses, uh, and communicating that successfully and meeting your disclosure requirements uh, under 408B2 really is the important piece uh, of that process. You know, so with that, I want to thank everybody for attending, you know, especially in a period of this much transition and, and flux. Um, I know it's hard. Uh, everybody's stretched uh, to do more uh, with less. Uh, we appreciate uh, you taking some time and, and, and hope it was a productive use of your time today. Um, I am going to take questions. As I mentioned, everyone is, is muted. Um, so I'm going to give uh, everyone a chance to find their uh, their app uh, and uh, tap out any questions uh, they may have today. This is always the hardest part for me because I in my head, I can't decide how long it actually takes to type a question. Um, I guess it depends on how long the question is. Here we go. I've got one. We are contacted frequently by people who want to do a review of our fiduciary efforts on our plan. Should we have an outside person do that for us? Well, I think a review is always good. Whether the person is outside or inside, I think is less relevant. I, I think um, reviews come from two two different two different avenues. So, um, one avenue and the one that I think can be productive for institutions who have questions about where they are from a fiduciary prudence, as you'll see, um, you know, a law firm uh, who uh, says, "Hey, we." you know, conduct these fiduciary reviews and, you know, are you interested in having an independent outside party uh, evaluate where you are from a, an operations perspective? And I think, you know, if you have a good, competent counsel who does that and that's an area of expertise, I think that can be uh, productive for, for a number of 
a number of reasons. Uh, they, they have a, a, certainly a different perspective, and I think it can help the risk management group get comfortable with where you are. The second thing that happens just as probably more frequently, frankly, um, is that um, you have institutions and, and financial services providers, record keepers, and others do reviews as a method to try and get information to help sell their service. And I think that's a much more common and, and frankly, much less uh, useful uh, exercise. Um, there are a number of uh, brokers across the country who are doing um, fiduciary reviews. Uh, and, and I think it would be uh, uh, unlikely that, that any of the effort that you would engage in would generate much that was very useful. Uh, I think if you were going to do it, you'd want to work with a higher education. Uh, somebody who works pretty extensively in higher education has a familiarity with the, the significant regulatory differences uh, between 401ks and 403bs, the significant vendor and product differences between 401ks uh, and 403bs. And, and third, and not unimportantly, the significant cultural differences between 401ks and 403bs. Um, I think that would be the, the, the threshold. So is, is doing a review good? Absolutely. If you're going to do it, make sure you do it uh, with the right providers, whether it's uh, the, the counsel and consultants you may be working with or whether it's, you know, an outside counselor party that doesn't have kind of an ax to grind or a product to sell. Well, with that, I am um, appreciative of everybody's time. Again, if you have questions that pop up after, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, my uh, contact information is available uh, pretty readily, uh, and you can reach me here in the office at not any time because frequently I'm out with clients, uh, but I'm happy to get back to you when I can. So again, thank you. Have a wonderful day uh, and a great rest of your week.